So let me welcome you all to our second event of 2023, second event for Wild Ones St. Louis chapter. Welcome. Came in spite of the rain. Good for you, although it's Welcome and introduction. My name is Marcia Gebhardt, and I'm the chapter president. And a reminder that we are the largest chapter in the country out of 80 plus chapters um, with about 380 household members, which is about 420 individual members um, who are eligible to come to tonight to our, our monthly gatherings and to certain other things that are member only. <clears throat> um, another fun thing about the chapter in this year, this is our 25th anniversary. So we are not only, yeah, we're not only the largest, but we are also one of the oldest and one of the most active in the country. Um, our 25th anniversary will be celebrated in November uh, with a special um, gathering uh, with, with food and celebration of uh, founding members of Scott Woodbury, who founded the chapter, and of three of our current members who were founding members 25 years ago. Fran Glass, who is here tonight. Thank you, Fran. <laughs> Uh, was a longtime board member too. Um, just, just finally took a breath <laughs> and stepped down last year. And Penny Holtzman, who is current treasurer, has been for a number of years. <clears throat> and Kathy Bildner, who is not here tonight, but she is our grants chair um, and has been like the other two founding members active for. 25 years. So we will celebrate them in November and the chapter in general. So this is our fifth year of our popular speaker series. Um, we did Zoom only for the last two years during the pandemic, of course, and prior to that we did in person only. And so tonight is the second of what we call hybrid presentation, where we're doing not only folks here in person, but also folks at home on Zoom. And we're recording it so that you and others can view this presentation on our YouTube channel, which you get to by going to YouTube and then just put in St. Louis Wild Ones, and that'll take you to our channel. Um, and you might as well check it out now if you want to, because last week's last month's presentation by Sue Leahy is on there and also the three no no not the three okay just just Sue's from from January is still up and then this one will be up in a week or so um those of you on zoom reminder please turn off your uh video and mute your um audio couple of things I want to remind folks of before we get to our speaker, the reason we're all here tonight. One is about our membership program, uh, sorry, mentorship program, which is just for members. Um, you got a, a notice about it in our recent read all about it. But if you want to know more, um, you can go to our website and just search mentor, and that'll take you to the blog post and um, to application to be a mentor or a mentee. This program was piloted last year, um, and this year it's open to all members. So if you're interested in sharing what you know with two or three folks who live near you, um, two or three mentees, you can apply, and I bet you'll be accepted. And if you are interested in being a mentee, getting together a couple times, during the year, several times in uh, nearby yards with fellow mentees and your mentor. I encourage you to check it out. Sue um, Leahy will uh, talk a couple minutes about our um, native uh, plant, 
ID tag and the need for some help. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, so two things about plant tags. One, the website is up. Um, they can be shipped or there's an option to pick them up at an in-person gathering. There's a comment box to tell me which gathering you're going to be at. Um, so you can do that either way, but you can go ahead and order your tags. Um, I need a couple of people who are willing to help do some prep work on these tags on a regular basis. So if you're interested in that, please get in touch with me. You can reach me through the website. Um, we have to prep the stakes um, before we can sell the, the tags. So it's, it's grunt work, what can I say? But we have good conversation while we're doing it and I'll provide pizza, so there you go. Um, the other thing I wanna just mention is you're gonna see it come out in the next read all about it, but about tabling. If you have a small community event that you would like Wild Ones to be a part of and you can get a table at it, I can provide you with whatever materials you need to help promote Wild Ones at your local event. We're trying to do more localized tabling to reach people who don't, who haven't heard the word about native plants, basically. So, okay, thank you. Um, and then just a few other things, reminders or heads up about um, other big events that'll be coming up in the next couple of months in the area. Uh, Partners for Native Landscaping. I think many of you have attended some events through Partners for Native Landscaping in the past. This year, it's gonna be bigger and better than ever. Um, we will again have 10 webinars through the St. Louis County Library, um, all free. And it'll be from March 7 through April 5th. There is a Partners for Native Landscaping website now that's very good. So remember that and you can go to it um, and register right from there. See who the speakers are, something about what they'll be talking about and register directly from that website, which will be a lot nicer and easier than going through the St. Louis County Library system. Um, also on that website, you will see um, that we're going to do a half day in-person workshop again. It's been a few years and you know why, um, but this year, April 15th, it'll be at Powder Valley, a uh, half day on a Saturday, Saturday. Anyway, you can register for that through the Partners for Native Landscaping website too. However, it's not open yet. It's going to be free. And there will be room enough for 250 people. And I have a feeling that free um, and word goes out to all of the organ partner organizations. Um, it's we will let you know ASAP when registration starts so that you'll have a good chance of getting in. Um, and we are going to repeat the native plant fair which will be on April 30th. You'll be able to uh, see that on the website as well. There will be a St. Louis Native Plant Garden Tour again. And this year it's gonna be May 21st, earlier than usual and centering on U City. And so more information will come out about that. Um, then just a reminder, we are silver sponsors of Grow Native check out their website. They have webinars um, that are very interesting, if you haven't already. They have some master classes, which because we're silver sponsors, our members can attend free. And then also on their website, you will see an upcoming event that's always really good um, in Edwardsville. It's a, also a workshop, half-day workshop. This year is going to focus on um, kind of what we're starting to focus on, bringing it home, bringing it into the community, all of the spreading the word in more localized ways. And finally, don't forget St. Louis Community College. Um, they've got a lot of good instructors, many of whom whose names you know, Dave Tilka, um, Dan Pearson of Bring Conservation Home, Susie Van and Sue Leahy, have you already done one or you still have two? One, one more to, that you can register for. 
So lots, lots available, lots going on. Um, now to the reason that we're here. Uh, so Ed Spivak, curator of invertebrates at St. Louis Zoo. What a great job. And what a great job Ed has done for years in the community uh, speaking, just as he's speaking tonight and inspiring people and in educating people about the need to increase our native habitat so that we increase our native wildlife. Without further ado, and Ed says you can ask questions as he goes along if you have them. Hey, Ed. Thank you, Marcia. So I've known a number of you for years, but I think this is the first time I've spoken to you in person as a group for Wild Ones. So I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm always happy to talk about pollinators and particularly, what? I'm seeing you doing hand signals, I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm always happy to talk, particularly about native bees, because as you'll see, once you start working with native bees, you'll also be helping all of this other wildlife. There are probably a few things that many of you may, may be familiar with, but I'm gonna cover a lot of information. And those of you who know me, I have a lot of information to, part to, you know, to partake. But I first wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the St. Louis Zoo and also Wild Ones is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Osage Nation and the Illini Confederacy. We also acknowledge that this area and parts of Missouri have been traditionally used by others, including the Pawnee, Sac and Fox, Dakota, Nakota, Oto, Missouri, Omaha, Iowa, Quapaw, Chickasaw, Kickapoo, and the Haudenosaunee. The process of knowing and acknowledging the ground beneath our feet is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the people on this land before us. It familiarizes visitors with the cultures and histories of Missouri's indigenous tribes, as well as with their ties in the St. Louis region. We honor our heritage of native peoples and what they teach us about stewardship of the earth. And that's really about what we're talking about today too, is stewardship and particularly pollinators. So pollinators, about 90% of all of our flowering plants. And according to MOBOT, that's about 400,000 species of cell. There's still many that are being identified, but 90% of our flowering plants require pollinators of one sort or another. Have any of you ever heard of what's called the pollinator syndrome? So this was a way that people looked at what kind of plants and pollinators use. And this might be a little bit small, but uh, you can be, you'll view this online later, or if you want, I can send this to you. But it was a way of determining which flowers attract which types of pollinators. So for example, when you look at this table, um, for example, bats, color of their flowers are usually white, green, and purple. Usually no nectar guides because they're not seeing ultraviolet. Uh, usually a strong or musty odor emitted at night because that's when bats are active. Abundant nectar, ample pollen, and then bowl-shaped flowers close during the day because that's when the bats are active. If you look at, say, for example, bees, bright white, yellow, blue, or UV, you notice there's no red. Bees don't see red. So even a lot of plants that we plant that appear red to us actually may have blue or other casts to it that the bees are actually seeing. Uh, you've got nectar guides, fresh, mild, pleasant odor, nectar, uh, pollen, and then usually shallow landing platforms are often tubular depending upon the type of bee. So all of these different types of uh, flowers, you can kind of generally identify which pollinators are present. But this is also a handy way for you to determine when you're planting, if you want to increase diversity, you want to increase you know, those different types of pollinators, it gives you a little bit of an idea of what types of plants to plant. As when we're talking about pollinators, there's a lot of diversity. And there's more diversity than I'm actually gonna show you. Butterflies, of course, are the ones which people kind of recognize. They're not too afraid of them usually. Um, it's easier for me to sell, plant a butterfly garden than it is a bee garden. But when I'm talking to farmers, it's easy to talk about planting for bees than butterflies because they know the importance of bees for pollinating crops. But when I talk, particularly in an urban setting, particularly with schools, first thing to think about, I've got a lawsuit coming on you know, for a principal or a school teacher, uh, but butterflies are one that really attracts a lot of people right off. 
Moths are a group that don't get as much attention as they should, um, but they are incredibly important pollinators, and particularly at night. I'm also going to show later, there's actually a new book coming out on moth gardening. Um, it comes out in a few, couple months, but I'll show you that in the resources at the end. Beetles, beetles are actually the oldest group of pollinators, usually very open, shallow blossoms. Think of things like magnolias. That's really a beetle pollinated flower. And beetles pollinate in a way that's called, or historically called soil and mess. They're basically just walking around the flower, feeding and messing it up and pollinating at the same time. They're not actively pollinating. Uh, they just kind of do it as happenstance. Flies, incredibly important group of pollinators. I'll talk about them again in a moment. But this is another group that most people don't tend to think about. And many flies actually serve a number of purposes, not just as pollinators, but also as pest control agents. Birds. Around the world, there's a lot of different types of birds which are pollinators. Around here, it's really just ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, but they're, you know, we always love, my wife and I always love when the hummingbirds show up and we try to encourage them. Um, and we just love seeing them fight too because they're incredibly territorial. <laughs> bats. Bats, particularly for tropical areas, are incredibly important. The bats we have around here are insectivorous. But when you start going to either the Southwest US or the tropics, bats are very important pollinators for a lot of you know, different types of fruits and flowers. And wasps are also a group that don't get a lot of attention. They are not as important pollinators as some of these other groups, but the adults are feeding on nectar and in that process pollinating, but they serve that purpose of beneficials in dealing with some of the, what we regard as pests in our gardens. You know, whether they're dealing with caterpillars or aphids um, or uh, flies or whatever it might be. But bees are really the most important group of pollinators for a couple of reasons. I've listed a few here, but most importantly, first off, bees actually collect pollen. So a number of pollinators, plants have evolved ways of just attaching to them or because they're hairy or furry, just sticks to them. But bees are actively collecting pollen because that's the, what they feed their kids. That is the, the proteins, the lipids, the vitamins they're feeding. They also show what's called flower constancy, which means when a bee goes on, say, a goldenrod flower, it goes to a goldenrod flower to a goldenrod. It's going aster, aster, aster. If it goes goldenrod to aster, it's really not helping the plants to produce seeds or fruit. So that flower constancy is incredibly important. When we look at from a relatively selfish point of view, from an anthropocentric, a human point of view, 75% of our crops require pollinators. In the US, over $29 billion is due just to honeybees and native bees. And I say over 29 billion, because if you think about things like the value of a tomato, there's that value tomato and whatever, you know, bumblebee pollinated that for the tomato. But now if you now include every hamburger joint, every pizza place, every Italian restaurant, that bottle of ketchup, that value of a tomato goes far beyond just that original value. Worldwide, upwards of $577 billion. And as a general rule, about one out of every three mouthfuls of food that you eat or drink depends upon pollinators, most of those being bees. Now why three quarters of our crop, but only one third of our diet, it's because a lot of our diet is bulk wind pollinated, corn, rice, wheat, barley, oats, which you can live on, not very healthily, but if you want color, if you want flavor, if you want nutrition, then think about the pollinators. And this is just a simple sample of some of the crops that either are completely dependent upon bees or are enhanced by the presence of bees. So for example, coffee. Coffee is either wind or self-pollinated depending upon the species, but you add bees to the mix, you can increase your yields by 20%. Some things like almonds, 100% dependent upon bees. So there's a whole diversity of plants that we depend upon pollinators for. Now, as I mentioned, flies are really important. They're actually the second most important group for our crops next to bees. So whether it's hoverflies, blowflies, or even houseflies, these are incredibly important. And I'll talk a little bit later on how you design a little bit to attract uh, flies to your garden. But we don't tend to think about flies. We just tend to think about annoyance of them. But, but flies are incredibly important for the garden and our food. And of course, the food of the gods, 
Theobroma, that is a genus for chocolate, means food of the gods, is dependent upon this little midge fly. Without that midge fly, so bees don't do it, birds don't do it, bats don't do it, just this little tiny fly is what we depend upon for chocolate, for the essence of life. But remember, it's not all about us. So when we think about bears feeding on fruits and nuts and seeds, box turtles in Forest Park feeding on ground strawberries, or birds feeding on the fruits and seeds, it's most of the life on the planet some way can be traced back to pollinators because they are the keystone species for a lot of environments. Now, okay. Now there are some plants we don't tend to think about for pollinators that we think, oh, it's self-pollinator. I've never seen a, a, <laughs> uh, a bee or a fly or anything there. So one of the examples are strawberries. This is a strawberry that's self-pollinated. No bees or flies or anything. It doesn't taste very good, not marketable. Um, if you add some wind, you start getting something which sort of looks like a strawberry, but you add a bee like this small carpenter bee, now you start getting something which is sweet, nutritious, marketable. It's really due to those pollinators. We often tend to think about our non-native uh, European honeybees as like the be all and end all to bees. Uh, but when we look at things like, say for example, apples here, honeybees can pollinate apples, you get a nice fruit, but if you have a mix of native bees, you now see that the apple is larger, it has a better seed sets, it's larger, um, more nutritious. So it's really about diversity, not just abundance. Because when you look at all the different types of bees ranging in size from two millimeters to over an inch, each one's gonna work a flower a little bit differently. So it actually increases overall pollination. So the big takeaway, when we think about pollinators, you think about your garden, it's all about diversity. I keep hitting this thing. Hopefully it's not making noise in the, to our guests at home. They have a complaint. Okay, good. We're good. <laughs> and as I said, when people tend to think about bees, they tend to think about this, the European honeybee. Uh, honeybees are a bit of an aberration. Uh, there are only about seven species of honeybees worldwide compared to the 20,000 species of bees worldwide. They range in size here in the United States from this little one, which is Perdita minima, no common name, only two millimeters long. The face you may recognize if you've got a wooden porch, deck, carport, uh, that is a face of a large carpenter bee female. Uh, not necessarily the largest bee we have here, but it gives you a good idea of that size range. And as you can see, all of these different bees are different sizes from small mask bee, small carpenter bee, uh, veracity green metallic sweat bee, Andrina carlini, uh, no common name really, uh, spring polyester bee, sunflower longhorn bee, leaf cutter bee, small resin bee, or black and yellow bumblebee. This is just a sampling of the diversity. <laughs> oh, oh. Maybe if I, I, I turn, yeah, I'll just, or I could just lower it a little bit. But our native bees, our pollinators, beneficial insects are disappearing from, unfortunately, some of the same reasons it's affecting a lot of species. Loss of habitat and fragmentation is the biggest one. This is where you guys come in by creating habitat. That's incredibly important for a lot of species. Invasive plant species, changes in agricultural practices, misuse of pesticides, diseases and parasites, pollution, competition with tree species. And as this one paper says, it's really a death by a thousand cuts. All of these things together are affecting our pollinators and all of our wildlife. I'm a big fan of David Attenborough. Hopefully you all are too. Um, I've also been privileged enough to spend a whole day with David Attenborough when he was uh, filming Life in the Undergrowth, which is about invertebrates. But these two quotes leads into the rest of my talk. Uh, to restore stability to our planet, therefore we, we must restore its biodiversity. The very thing we have removed, it is the only way out of this crisis that we ourselves have created. We must rewild the world. Rewilding the world is e easier than you think. A century from now, our planet could be a wild place again. So I want to introduce you to this word rewild if you've never heard it before. From the Global Charter for Rewilding, 
Rewilding means helping nature heal. Rewilding means giving space back to wildlife and returning wildlife back to the land as well as to the seas. Rewilding means the mass recovery of ecosystems and the life supporting functions they provide. Now that may seem rather grandiose and oftentimes we tend to think about wolves, beavers, you know, bison as a part of rewilding. Uh oh, I've lost control. But we can do urban rewilding. So returning your landscape back to nature is possible, for even it's often hard to reach in this direction, for even the most urban of environments, stepping back and allowing natural processes to, to occur. And that's what rewilding is about, allowing natural processes. So having that diversity, letting nature kind of take its course. So it's uh, help re process reducing management at the yard to encourage Good wild plants and insects are dirt. Rewild begins with recognizing native plants as the basis of the local food web that is essential for populations of native insects and other wildlife. There is this whole movement to rewilding here in the United States, in Europe, but everyone can be part of rewilding. And I like the term rewilding, though academics argue about what does it mean, what does it mean to so and so, but it's an easy one for just think about what you're doing. You're just rewilding. It's an easy one, I think, for people to understand as opposed to restoration ecology. You know, anything, it's a, you're rewilding. You're creating that space again. So I've reworked my talks various ways over the years. This is a new one for kind of a new audience. This is my 10 tips to rewild your home for pollinators. And we're gonna go through each of these tips. Uh, tip number one, plant native plants. Those are, Fair section. But we're going to go through each of these. So it hopes it gives you an idea of what you can do at home or in a community, et cetera. So number one, plant native plants. They enhance native biodiversity. They provide pollen nectar. They recreate native habitats. And they're adapted to the local climate. When we look at St. Louis, we've got floods. We've got drought. Our native plants are adapted to that. One of the reasons are because of their roots. Those deep roots allow them to tap into those deep resources to sustain the life even when the upper portions may be either grazed or because of drought or fire that resource of roots allows those plants to grow back it also stabilizes the soil it allows water infiltration so it reduces flooding it sequesters carbon there's so many benefits to our native plants and when you look at our native plants to say something like fescue that people put on their lawn you can see the vast difference between the root systems and the benefits that they hold. When you're planting, generally avoid cultivars and double blossoms. So we often, you go to places and see these beautiful things. Roses are, are probably the best example. When we have modified roses, we have taken away one part of the flower which produces the, the pollen, the stamens, and we actually make it into a petal. So you're actually taking food away from the bees and other pollinators and also making it harder for them to get to the nectar because you're adding more and more petals. So by avoiding things like uh, some of the various cultivars, picking double blossoms, and you can see in this particular case, this is a native rose and how easy it is for this little mass bee to get in. This a little bit of cultivar has a few more petals. It makes it just a little more difficult for that small carpenter bee to get in there. Also, when you look at cultivars, look at the world from the animal's point of view, from that bee's point of view. Remember with that pollinator syndrome, you know, what do bees see? They see yellows, they see white, they see ultraviolet. They don't see green. And for some of these, they, there might be nectar, gar, uh, nectar guides, there might not be. So when you look at purple coneflower, they're kind of a regular style, but when you start doing a double blossom, you've gotten rid of all the excess to pollen and nectar, uh, this green one, bees may not even see it. There are some cultivars though, when you look at them, they still have that same sort of general structure and color. And it has been shown that some of those are still very attractive to pollinators, but I always recommend if you can go native, go native. Plant for a succession of blooms too. Think about the seasons, spring, summer, and fall. Oftentimes people think of, oh, I'm off on vacation during the summer, the kids are home, um, and that's when I, tend to enjoy the garden, but spring and fall are incredibly important 
when we start looking at these. And as a general thumb, at least have three blooming species in those time periods. One of the reasons is different bees are active at different times. Now you do not have to memorize these scientific names of bees, but when you think about um, Hylaeus, which is a small mass bee, Agathora, Agathora, Helictus, Agapasma, Leziglossum, those are sweat bees. Ceratina, small carpenter bee, Bombus, bumblebees. You can find these usually throughout the year, from April through October, one species or another. But some, like Osmia, which is, is the mason bee, really only April and May. This is also makes them one of the best pollinators for trees, and fruit trees in particular. And in Melisodes, the longhorn bees, usually just August and September. So when we start thinking about those summer blossoms, it's gonna help those. So having that diversity throughout the year is incredibly important. What I've done, just to kind of visualize in a, a real easy way to kind of start looking at your own garden. Do a spreadsheet, look at the plants that you have in your garden. Whoops. Look at when they're blooming. See if you have any gaps. Do you have things blooming March, April, all the way to October or September? There's a second page of this, which is not showing. Um, but are you covering the whole season? This is an easy way to see what is missing. Uh, this sheet that I've put together, um, if you're interested, uh, my email address is at the end. I'm happy to send this to you. This includes mostly natives and trees and shrubs, but also a few exotics, um, which are also beneficial, like oregano. Oregano is a great bee plant. Uh, it produces a lot of blossoms. It doesn't go bad after it blooms, and a lot of bees love oregano. And the best example I like to give in really stressing seasons are bumblebees. Bumblebees, the queens only live for a year. When we think about honeybees, those queens may live two, four, if you're lucky, even up to seven years or so. But a bumblebee queen only lives for a year. So right now, all of our bumblebee queens who have made it last year are hibernating. What they did this past fall is feed up. So think about a bear getting ready for hibernation. They're feeding on pollen and nectar, put on those energy reserves so they can hibernate. When spring comes, they need those floral resources, particularly trees and shrubs, to be able to start their colony. And then during the summer, of course, they need all those flowers during the summer in order to sustain the colony. So if you do not have anything in the fall, those bees can't overwinter. If you do not have anything in the spring, those bees can't start their colonies. So this is, a, to me, a really good example of thinking about spring and fall as part of the bee's life cycle. Planted diversity of plants, too, with different flower shapes. As I mentioned before, you have all of these different sizes of bees. And one of the ways we look at bees is we look at their tongues. So here is a small carpenter bee male on uh, hydrangea, native hydrangea. This is a very small bee, relatively short tongue. When you look at something like this, uh, this Anthophora, now the tongue looks fairly long right there, but when it's fully extended, it is much longer. So deep tubular flowers are ones that this bee really prefers. And as I said, with flies, when you think about helping the flies, think about a fly, you know, you know, house fly lands on your, unfortunately, your table, whatever, it is a very short proboscis. Um, so really having these flat, open platform shapes, simple flowers, a uh, long bloom period. Um, if you really want to get into the smell too, I mean, there's some of them that really stink. They smell like poop. Uh, but things like golden rods, which also have a shallow blossom, I've seen many tachinid flies on those. And then you want to maximize your overall diversity. So I mentioned about three blooming per season, but 15 to 25 species at least to really maximize diversity in your garden. Um, and as I said, you start supporting the bees, it's going to support the butterflies, it's going to support a variety of different species. And also think about what is a flower? A flower is really a signpost, a billboard. So when bees are scanning around looking at your garden, they're looking for those flowers. Now, like if you're going down to Lake of the Ozarks, you may see one billboard, but as you get closer, you see more and more billboards. It's really stressing. You're going Lake of the Ozarks. Same thing with your garden. 
having not just one blossom of a species, but having a whole mass of it. It's just like billboards on a highway. Additionally, what you can do is plant them in a series. So that actually encourages that very natural foraging behavior of the bees going from one flower to the next flower. So you can scatter them throughout, but most importantly, having more than just one blossom, that one specimen in your garden. Also, as you're planting, think about the distances bees fly. And in general, rule of thumb, the smaller the bee, the shorter the distance it can fly. This is some work that was done um, in Maine. This is in Houston. And general ideas showing how basically larger bees can fly farther, smaller bees fly much shorter distances. So when you start thinking about where you're going to plant, and particularly from a community point of view, and I'll talk about that in a moment too, how far apart you can have these gardens to make sure you're supporting all of these bees. Bees. Yes. yes. So if you only fly two meters, when you do prairie birds, does that affect small bees? Uh, it is going to affect small bees. Yeah, so the question was, if some of these smaller bees can only go 250 meters, and if you're doing, say, a prairie burn, is that going to affect that population? And yes, it can. This is why, particularly in things like a prairie burn, you do not burn it all at once. You also want to change the season. A general of thumb is only one third of the area so that the other areas still have those bees to reestablish in the area that was burned. So, but that is, uh, but if you have one isolated patch, which is only, you know, say 250 meters across, you burn the whole thing, you could potentially wipe out that whole population. Bee feeding strategies too, uh, there are, and this only refers to bees. These are your three big words for the evening, polyelectric, oligolectic, and monolectic. And that just refers to the different types of pollen and nectar that the bee takes in. So polyelectric, think of a honeybee or a bumblebee. Poly meaning many, they feed on many different types of pollen and nectar. So many different types of flowers will be attracted. Oligolectic, oligo meaning few, they only feed on a few varieties. Um, maybe even just one genus um, or one family. And monolectic, it could be even just one species for some bees. So when you start lo looking at that, here in Missouri, this is work done by Mark, Mike Arduza, formerly of MDC. When you look at things like the Asteraceae, the asters and their relatives, a large number of bees only feed on pollen and nectar from the asters. But you also can see there are beans, there are willows, there are specialists on those. So if you want to also attract that diversity, think about some of the specialist bees in your garden too. And some of those specialist bees are th things like our Southeastern blueberry bee, 90 to 95% of its diet is just blueberry pollen and nectar. Hibiscus bee, hibiscus, um, hardy hibiscus, um, even the exotic um, Rose of Sharon, but Rose Mallow are incredibly important. That's the only thing it really feeds on. Take it for the females. Squash bee, cucurbit, squashes, melons, sweet potato vine bee, sunflower bee. So if you do not have these plants, you do not have those bees. Probably the best example of when we think about the specialist, not a bee, but monarchs. The only thing a monarch caterpillar can eat is milkweed. So if you do not have milkweed, you are not going to support monarchs. But the nice part is monarchs are not the the best pollinator. It's the bees who are actually pollinating the milkweed. The monarchs depend upon that milkweed. It's a great nectar source for them. But from a pollination point of view, the bees are really uh, the workers in making sure that we have milkweed for generations and particularly for generations of monarchs. Now I know number one was a big one. The others are relatively short. Number two, don't forget trees and shrubs. As I mentioned, some of these spring bees, sometimes the only things in bloom during the spring are trees and shrubs. So think of some of those things like red maple, you know, red buds, crab apples, and also some of the, the non-native fruit trees. Chokeberry is a great one. I love chokeberry. And then willow. We do have a number of bees which are specialists on willows. But also remember too, the fruits of those, many of those trees also provide us with flavor in our diet. 
but also a lot of other animals. So when you start thinking about things like crab apples, choke cherries, black cherries, wild plum, you know, you have, here's uh, Osmia lignaria, blue orchard mason bee, blueberries, choke berries, service berry, also called shadberry, shadbush, juneberry. All of these are going to be benefiting birds and other wildlife too. Yes, in the back. So are the trees and shrubs similar with the flowers if you want to kind of like yeah. Yeah. So having that sort of diverse. So the question was with the trees, do we also want to have that diversity of blossoms? Yes, we do. Uh, the nice part is, or one thing to think about is often they'll bloom sort of in sequence. So you may have an apple bloom and then a chokeberry blooms and then a plum blooms. So you can have this nice sequence. They may not all bloom at the same time. But when you think about a bee's general life, not talking about the queens, when they're active and about, it's about six weeks. So when we look at things like apples and plums, whatever, their bloom time is usually 10 days, two weeks. So we need to make sure we've got several blooming in succession in order to sustain their life cycle. So we look at my wife's, uh, our house, we've got red bud, willow, wild plum, Mexican plum, service berry, chokeberry, um, all in our front yard blooming. And that really gives that diversity for bees. Yes? So two or three of each one of those? Um, that depends upon, for me, whether the plant needs cross-pollination. So for example, apple apples require cross-pollination. The uh, service berry is not necessarily, while plum not necessarily, but for diversity for them, it's actually beneficial. It's interesting, our two wild plums, uh, we bought, I bought them both from Murph Wallace from Missouri Wildflower Nursery. And even though they're both supposed to be the same thing, the fruits are a little bit different. So one is perfectly spherical, a little bit more tart, the other is oval um, and sweeter. So even within the same variety, it can be a little bit different. So it just adds spice to your life as well as spice to the, the animals around you. And this, Hopefully you're all devotees and followers of Doug Tallamy. And I always kind of throw this in in case you're unaware. So 90% of all insects that eat plants require native plants to complete their development. And Bringing Nature Home, the classic book. Um, I also list his two other books at the end. But, and he also has a kid's book coming out too, if you don't know. Uh, Bringing Nature Home children's book comes out in April. And we start thinking about some Songbirds, 96% of our North American land birds feed their young with insects, including caterpillars and mostly caterpillars. So if you do not have the plants, you do not have the caterpillars, you do not have the songbirds. So we can put out a bird feeder during the winter for a cardinal, but during the breeding season, that cardinal is feeding their kids caterpillars. And we start looking at how much you should be doing. Uh, Hit, Doug and his students have worked out that approximately 70% of that habitat should be in native plants to support the insects, which then also supports the birds and other wildlife. So it doesn't mean that you can't have any exotics, and we all like a few here and there, something interesting, maybe change it up a little bit. But as a general rule of thumb, look at 70% of your space, and is it in native plants? And he has a number of nice uh, listings. Uh, if you are limited in trees, oak is the major one for supporting the total number of different types of moth and butterfly caterpillars. So you can start thinking about, well, I only have a place to plant one tree. And there are dwarf oaks and stuff too. So don't be too concerned. Uh, Doug in his one book on uh, oaks also talks about, you don't really have to be afraid of an oak growing, falling over, piercing your you know, basement. There are ways of doing it in a way that they actually support each other too, just like they do in the forest. So he has listings of both trees and shrubs. These are really keystone plants in order to support the caterpillars. What happened? Um, and then also wildflowers too. So things like goldenrod and asters, two are very important. We have a tendency to get weirded out by goldenrod. Uh, some people who believe that goldenrod causes hay fever. Goldenrod does not cause hay fever, but it's been believed for decades, if not centuries. The problem is goldenrod blooms at the same time as ragweed, particularly giant ragweed. You don't notice them, 
Do you see the goldenrod? And when you have you know, drug companies trying to sell you an anti-allergy medicine, do they show you this field of green? No, they show you flowers. So really the only time that goldenrod is a problem, if you shove it up your nose, then it's a problem. But otherwise it's not an issue. Number three, forget tidy. Nature is not tidy. Now, some of us with either a homeowners association or whatever, there is sometimes a tidy aspect, but there are ways of dealing with that. One is to let people know what you're doing. We have a leave the leave sign up in at our house. So it lets people know that this area in particular is where the leaves are. And when you think about leaves, there are some butterflies, moths, which actually feed on those dead leaves. Others, which actually, like luna moths, create their cocoons out of those dead leaves, and other species which overwinter in those leaves. So it's incredibly important to have those. So signage is a good one to let people know that you're just not making a mess. It's intentional. Additionally, some of these plants are important for a lot of species. So when you look at things like these little two-spotted longhorn uh, bee males, they will rest on, and we've only seen them in our garden, only resting on dead plants. So when you clean it up, so they're all sleeping together at night. And every night they'll come back to the same spot. Additionally, some where you've got these stems, we have mason bees nesting in this stem. So when they're cut off, they're still utilizing those plants. And eventually these will break down and be replaced by new plants, but don't necessarily get too tidy and neat. And also some rotting wood. So this bee, Augencora pura, green, uh, green metallic sweat bee, it actually nests in rotting wood. So if you don't have, and it'll actually dig out its own nest in there, but if you don't have little pieces of rotting wood, there'll be no place for it to nest. Now, as I said, you can do a semblance in the appearance of tidy. Uh, one easy way, put some, um, put some fences around it so it looks intentional. You can also just have a mowed edge to things. Uh, this actually happens at our house. So we got our neighbors getting very into native plants, but we have signs, we have little fences, we have a mowed edge. And one of our neighbors who really saw our stuff really got excited. She plants all this stuff. She unfortunately has been cited by the city <laughs> and we're only kitty corner from her. They've never said anything to us. So there are ways of still letting nature do what it wants to do, but in sometimes this perception that we need to have some sort of tidiness. Add water. Um, just like, you know, all life requires water. So if you've got, you know, a large place, you do a large pond. <laughs> this is actually on the Flathead Nation in Montana, uh, a bit larger than most people have, but bird baths, and if you can find something aesthetic, this is actually one of ours. We actually found, this is for my wife's birthday one year, and it actually came with this little bee sculpture. And the weird part is we get all these honeybees now hanging on this little bee sculpture, drinking the water. We don't tend to see them at the other bird bath, but we do see them with the giant bee. Number five, provide nesting sites for bees. Now we often think about the flowers, the food and the nectar, but the bees also need some place to nest. And we have basically two general groups when we start looking at our native bees. We've got ground nesting bees and twig and tunnel nesting. So about 70% of our native bees are ground nesters. And most of those require just, just a little bare patch of ground. So you don't necessarily just have to have grass all over a plant. Just a little bare patch will attract a number of species of bees in that area. This is Agapostum viricens. Uh, from our former house in, in Dogtown. And you'll see these like little turrets or sometimes just the face of the bee looking out at you as they're protecting that entrance from other bees or flies or ants or whatever it might be. So you actually may have some of these in your garden. Just look around. So looking for some of these holes or look for something going in and out or something just staring out of that hole at you. Some of our ground nesting bees we have around here, Boreston cream metallic sweat bee, squash bee, hibiscus bee, mining bee, sunflower bee. And as I said, about 70% of our native bees are ground nesters. Now you can also do intentional bee beds. We're actually gonna run an experiment with SLU, UMSL, Webster, and Maryville 
to create kind of a little standalone raised bed for ground nesting bees, hoping that it works, because then it'd be something that anybody can just do in their backyards. Uh, but what I did in our house, I dug out uh, 10 inches down. There's, there's very little information online. One study did 20 inches, but if you've ever dug 20 inches into St. Louis clay soil, it's like, after 10 inches, like, okay, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. So this was, you know, approximately three feet by three feet, 10 inches deep. I just put a little bit of shoring of wood just so it doesn't collapse. And within the first year, I had little sweat bees as well as mining bees utilizing this bare area. And if you notice there's something odd going on up here, you can actually enhance it by some of our twig and tunnel nesting bees will nest in vertical stems. And what these are, are just stems of either hydrangea or particularly uh, blackberry or raspberry just stuck in the ground because some bees like the small carpenter bee will nest in those areas. And this is a little female small carpenter bee coming out of one of those pithy stems. Yes. Are you leaking down to just to soften the soil or yeah. no vegetation? Or? Um, it did two things. Because um, we had, you know, I wanted to remove the grass in that area, but also just to kind of loosen it up a bit. I also added a little bit of sand back into that clay. Though there are some bees which love clay, some prefer sand. I just thought it would just make it a little bit more diverse. And you can actually run an experiment at home. Try one just clay, do one that's just sand, do one that's a nice loam. Uh, and because this is one area that we still need a lot more information on which bees like what kind of soils. Anyway. The other 30% of our native bees are twig and tunnel nesters. They usually use pre-existing holes. They don't tend to make them themselves, except in those like pithy stems. So when you think of things like, you know, hollow stems, or this is where people are selling the, the bee hotels, bee condos, et cetera. That's what's attracting these or just any hole. If you've been doing any work at home, you've put a drill in a wall or pulled out a screw or pulled out a nail, there actually might be a bee that's actually been nesting in there. And if you're not sure what's going on, this is kind of what's going on underground too. This is a blue orchard mason bee. These are some observation uh, blocks that I had made. And here's one looking out, resting inside. Here it is sealed. And here is within a little phragmites, which is a type of reed filled up. But inside, they've put what's called bee bread, which is a little bit of pollen and nectar laid in egg. And this is a mason bee. So mason bees use mud. They're mason. So they separate each of their cells with mud. And you can see as the uh, egg gets bigger, it hatches. They start feeding on the pollen mass and then eventually fill up the whole space and then produce a little cocoon. And then the next year, they'll emerge. So this is all happening without even us knowing what is going on. Oh, there you go. This is the first bee hotel that uh, we ever did at our house. It was just a simple four by four block of wood, which of course is, you know, the way it's cut is actually three and a half by three and a half. So I could do a three and a quarter inch deep hole, mounted it near our garden. And actually within that very first year, I had some some little potter wasps, but also some leaf cutter bees almost immediately using that. And here's an alfalfa leaf cutter bee. My camera is about an inch or two away. She could care less about me. So if you do this, put it where you can watch, with, you know, yourself, with your family, with your kids, neighborhood kids, teachers, whoever you want. This is a great one to see the bees coming in and out, carrying pollen, carrying leaves, carrying in mud, whatever it might be, depending upon the species. Here's another alfalfa leaf cutter bee, and you can see she's used a little bit of um, geranium leaf and a little bit of coreopsis petal to fill her uh, cell. Here's a alfalfa leaf cutter bee looking very meanly at me, trying to scare me away. Sometimes, yes. Sorry, uh, no problem. You mentioned three and a half inches. I think. What's the what's the minimum you need to? So the question is, uh, how deep should, literally, how deep should those holes be? So a general rule of thumb is if the hole is less than a quarter inch in diameter, it should be three to four inches deep. If it is quarter inch or larger, it should be five to six inches. Now, the reason for that is bees determine the sex of their young 
if the egg is fertilized or not. If the egg is fertilized, it becomes a female. If the egg is not fertilized, it becomes a male. And what these bees will tend to do is lay the female eggs in the back and the males in front because the males are a little more expendable. So if something comes in from the front, like a woodpecker's tongue, uh, they'll take a, a male or two, uh, but the females are still protected. If you shorten that hole, they may actually may produce more males. So you can actually skew the sex ratio by having the, the hole uh, not as deep as it should be. Was it? Uh, so first off, it should be near the garden if possible. Generally facing it north or east to south so they can get the morning sun or afternoon sun because they warm up. Uh, they will utilize them in other areas, particularly sheltered. So we've got a number of bee hotels on our, our porch, which are all facing west, uh, but they're sheltered and we have a lot of bees using those. Um, the whole porch during the summer is just covered with bees. Um, but in general, face them, uh, as I said, east to south and put them where you can see them. There, are, there is thought that depending upon the height, it may change the species composition. So it's also something you can play with. But what I usually recommend, put it where you can watch because it's just so fascinating to watch these bees go in and out. What? Yeah, so if it, the question was, if it's too low, you may get some predators, you know, whether it be raccoons, skunks, um, other things which can reach it. Uh, there are certain things like uh, woodpeckers, they seem to be more easily able to deal with the blocks as opposed to the, the reeds uh, because they can just sit on the front of your um, the bee hotel and just kind of pick them off, you know, one by one. And there are ways of doing that. There are some companies which will actually sell a, little, a bird guard, which is basically just a little metal screen. Crown Bees out of Washington does this where it just protects the, the front so the woodpeckers can't get to it easily. Yes? So if you put one, do you just leave it year after year after year, or do you need to put up a new one every two years? Yeah, so the general rule of thumb is you want to replace them every two to three years because you will get a build up. You will get a buildup of uh, mites and fungus. Uh, some of the ones where the, you have the tubes, you can also uh, very easily do like a paper liner and that you could clean out each year, just remove that paper liner. But the bees themselves actually clean out the, the nests themselves. But yeah, usually try to replace them. Yes? Are bees particular if it's treated or untreated food or is it best to use untreated? It's best to use untreated, but for some of the, uh, particularly like four by four and six by six, it's darn near impossible to find untreated unless you special order it. So that first bee block I did was actually treated wood and it did not seem to affect the bees. Uh, they used it for several years um, with no issues whatsoever. Oh, um, as, as I was gonna say, sometimes you may already have them if you've just been some pruning around the house. So this is hydrangea. So hydrangea has this nice pithy stem, but if you see what looks like uh, either a hole or a little bit of compost, something's been using it. In this particular case, I opened it up like you can see, you know, three cocoons in there. In this particular case, it was not a bee. It was actually a little cabronid wasp, which is a specialist on flies. So it's collecting flies in the garden to feed its kids. And then sometimes you may be lucky enough to actually see the bee going in and out. This is an elderberry. I watched this leaf cutter bee spend two days taking in cut leaf material into the nest in order to create individual cells. So as I said, different. Based on the common names, these different types of bees use different materials. So the mason bees use mud. The leaf cutter bees like this use uh, leaves and flower petals. This is just an example of some of the different types of bees. So leaf cutter bee, carter bee, another leaf cutter bee, small resin bee, mason bee. But when you look in the garden too, you may see actually the bee actually cutting out this nice oval or circle off the edges. Uh, you may just see the remnants here and there. This is not beetles, this is not caterpillars, this is uh, bees. Sometimes they can get amazingly active. So this is a rose from our garden. If you look closely, it looks like lace. 
they've had just about every single leaf. And the leaf cutter bees just went to it, did not kill the rose. Um, it just kept on growing, didn't seem to bother at all. But for some reason, a lot of leaf cutters love roses. Um, I don't know what it is about the leaves. We've seen places where the only plant around is a rose, not even any pollen nectar sources, but the leaves are missing sec sections of them because of the bees. Um, or, as I said, there's a carter bee. This bee actually scrapes the hair off of leaves. So this is on white sage. So this female is scraping the hair and then using that to make her nest. So it looks like cotton has just been shoved into the bee hotel. And as I said, if you've done any work around the house, this isn't a concrete wall at the insectarium at the zoo by our service door. When they were building it, they had a wooden form and some either bolts or nuts or uh, nails. And when they removed it, it left these holes. And I looked in there the one time and saw this female looking out, um, or you'll see it sealed up with leaf material. So you may have these already around the house. Just check out any holes that you may have. Another bee which will utilize these holes, this is a small resin bee. This is, I mean, small bass bee. This is on milkweed, so you can get an idea of the individual florets of common milkweed. This is a very small bee. This is a group that's called polyester cellophane bees. So they line their nest with this plastic-like cellophane material. And this hole is only one eighth inch in diameter to give you an idea of how small this bee is. And you can do all sorts of things with bee hotels. We had our students do this a few years ago up in Florissant, just upcycling wood and creating the sculpture. And that first year we had five different species of bees nesting in there. Now the large carpenter bees, they'll make their own nests. Um, sometimes where you want, sometimes not. Um, but they make these beautiful holes and they are also incredibly important pollinators. Six, eliminate pesticides. We all pretty much know about that. I mean, sometimes they can be important, but try to limit it as much as possible because also we are looking at besides the pollinators, our pest control. So flies like this, this hoverfly, as an adult, they're pollinators. But as young, they're predators of aphids and scales and other things. So they will lay their eggs on the plants and the maggot will go around feeding on everything. So as the young, it's a beneficial feeding on pests. And as adult, it's a very important pollinator. So if you're using pesticides, you can actually affect both sides of the spectrum. Other flies which may utilize flower uh, nectar or pollen. This is a uh, feather-legged fly. This is actually a specialist on squash bugs. It will grab a squash bug, lay its egg on a squash bug, and the maggot will burrow inside and eat the squash bug from the inside out. This is what are called parasitoids. So parasites don't tend to kill the host. Parasitoids like this tachinid fly, which we'll often see on goldenrod late in the season. Um, they lay their eggs on the host, the maggots burrow in and eat them from the inside out. Very, very cool. <laughs> and as I want to also touch on very briefly too, a lot of the pesticides that we see sprayed around and uh, Brent was actually one place where they've actually realized it's not cost effective to spray for mosquitoes, but still other communities. The most important thing, if you are concerned about mosquitoes and you want it in spraying, first off, look for water resources. Any place that can hold water can be a potential nesting site, and particularly for this one. Aedes albopictus, um, the Asian uh, tiger mosquito, it is a cavity nester. It can nest and uh, lay its eggs in even a bottle cap with water. So making sure that uh, you clean those areas out. Additionally, there are some biological ways of dealing with it. Uh, uh, BTI, which is a bacteria, which you can get at Home Depot, et cetera. Uh, these uh, bacteria kind of specialize on the aquatic insects. They actually cause their guts to perforate inside um, as the insects filter feed them in. So when you think of mosquito larva in water, uh, chironomid. You do have to be careful though, if you have a natural body of water, I wouldn't, and you have life in there like dragonfly naiads and others, uh, it could affect that life cycle. So if you have a area of standing water, which is not necessarily a natural body, but you can't necessarily dump, the BTI works very well. 
you can also create traps. This is a very simple trap for Culex, which is a house mosquito. Get any old bucket of water, fill it with some water, put some plant cuttings in there. So it just kind of steeps, creates bacteria. The female mosquito will lay these rafts of eggs, which look like you know sesame seeds. And then all you have to do is just dump them out, throw it on the lawn, or if you can't dump it, BTI. But you don't have to use chemicals for this species. And additionally, depending upon the plant you put in there, can also affect the hatch rate of the eggs and their survival. Interestingly enough, it's the invasive plants which actually you have better success um, if you want to raise mosquitoes than some of our native plants. And also for the uh, Asian tiger, you can also buy what's called a gap trap, which is a gravid 80s trap. And what happens, same thing, put the water and a little bit of plant material. They're cavity nesters, so they fly into here. But then because of this translucent area, they're trying to fly this way and they can't find their way out. Uh, but also a non-chemical way of dealing with mosquitoes. And the last couple of points. Seven, reduce or eliminate your lawns. Lawns are the largest irrigated crop in the United States. 50 million acres, larger than the state of Missouri. Think about setting aside half your lawn for half earth, for, for wildlife. You know, start thinking about, do we really need all the lawn? If you're playing football or if you've got a golf course, you know, or you know, a cricket pitch, that's a little bit different. But most of us, it's just a status symbol that goes back to the 1600s when English nobility thought that, hey, I don't need to grow food. I can grow something which nothing needs. And that's what we're doing with lawns. You can, though, if you have a lawn, you can make them bee friendly. Um, and this, this is work done at the University of Minnesota, but there's some general rules of thumb, too. You can, if you can, mow your lawn only every two to three weeks. And that's shown that you, you have more bee diversity if you can put it off. Raise your mower height to four inches if possible, but also adding other plants to your lawn, such as uh, things like white clover. So sweet Dutch white clover, bumblebees, honeybees, leafcutter bees will all utilize that. The University of Minnesota has some other suggestions too for some other plants that you could mix into your lawn, but also experiment too. Think about just creating a more diverse lawn. Plantains, even though they're non-natives, a lot of flies will use those plantains and also I've seen some bees utilizing those flower heads if you let them go to bloom. Number eight, turn off the lights. And particularly when we start thinking about moths and our nocturnal pollinators, lights have a lot of problems. You know, they're attracting animals away from either their mates or food resources. Um, it disrupts their life cycles. Um, it shifts whole communities. It causes a lot of issues and breaks up that relationship oftentimes between the animals and the plants. So what you want to do is if you have to have any outside lights, first off, change them to yellow. That is less attractive to insects. Secondly, um, if they don't need to be on, turn them off. And then also, if you need to have lights every once in a while, if you're concerned, put them on a motion sensor. You know, if you think about it, if you're concerned about some unsavory character coming into your yard and you have the lights going all the time, they know where the shadows are. But if the lights come on every once in a while, first off, you know something's happening, they know something's happening, but it also will disrupt their activities too. And it's also saving money by doing this. Um, yeah, they do it during spring and fall migration. And I think it's, is it uh, 10, days. 10 days? Yeah. Yeah, and that's, and luckily, I mean, they've gotten into that. And a number of other businesses also in St. Louis have also learned to cut down on their lights. The biggest problem we have right now is that LEDs are saving us energy, but then we start putting in LEDs, which are much brighter, and we're actually putting in more and more lights and saving money at the same time and disrupting all these natural life cycles. So we really need to think about how we utilize lights. It's really somewhat disturbing. Number nine, educate your neighbors. Add a pollinator habitat sign. As I said, 
you know, we have a leave to leave sign. We also have a native plant garden sign, which uh, promotes grown native. Uh, we're gonna be putting up another post with a rack card holder with a grown native rack card. So anybody that goes by and literally because of this and what we've been doing, it's been, it's well, it's actually been weird. We have people literally stopping at our house, ringing our doorbell and thanking us for what we're doing. We, we have people just driving by, honking their horns. Oh, thank you for what you're doing to, to, for the bees. It's the weirdest thing, but having these signs also is a way when you're not home to educate people about you know, resources like Grown Native um, or Xerxes or other groups which are promoting these native gardens. Oh, backwards again. And then at, along with that community aspect, connectivity is incredibly important. Connectivity is a safety net of nature. We have fragmented habitats all over. If you drive around here, you'll see a, a garden plot here, one here, a park here, a park here. We need to bring back nature. We need to put it back together, but we can do that in a variety of ways. Think about your neighborhood, working with your neighbors. Everyone's putting in a pollinator garden, a bee garden, a butterfly garden. Also now start thinking about how far those bees can fly. You start reconnecting habitats. You start doing something which reconnects nature. And it's also, you're hopefully reconnecting your community. How many of us now have not been talking to our neighbors? It, it becomes more and more relevant. Growing up as a kid, you knew everyone who was around. You played with them, they were kids. Now we often don't know who is living right next door. This is a way to reconnect ourselves to our community too. And there are ways of other ways of connecting. You know, you got adjacent backyards. Think about the trees which are already there existing. Where can we plant and working with neighbors to add that additional connectivity? If you are between areas, create a corridor so you're connecting habitats you know, or creating stepping stones or adding a buffer to an existing habitat. So there are different ways of adding that connectivity. And when we think about the ultimate connectivity of monarchs, they're flying from as far north as Canada down to Mexico. Every patch of milkweed and nectar plants is part of that monarch highway, that part, part of that connectivity. So we can all be part of that connection. Good. Did it again. And finally, rewild your thoughts. Rewilding is also about the way we think. It is about understanding that we are one species among many, bound together in an intricate web of life that ties us to the atmosphere, the weather, the tide, the soils, the fresh water, the oceans, and all living creatures on the planet. We need to really start thinking again that we are part of nature. John Muir said that we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. The Sakandro Glala Lakota, Mahdananji, the old Lakota was wise. He knew that man's heart away from nature becomes hard. He knew that lack of respect for growing living things soon led to a lack of respect for humans too. And then the final thoughts, this is the one which gets to some people, um, I'm gonna get stuck. Um, as I said, you plant a butterfly garden, you're gonna attract bees. Think about dealing with bees like you do with anyone else. Like right now, no one is swinging their arms. You start doing that and you hit your neighbor, they're gonna hit back. You walk around amongst a bunch of bees, start swinging your arms. You go to the gallery at Christmas and start swinging your arms, somebody's gonna hit you. Additionally, when a bee is on a flower, all it thinks about is pollen and nectar. It's like when you're at dinner, all you think about is eating and drinking. They're not thinking about hurting anyone. You shouldn't be, and just treat them as you should be treating everyone else. And it really isn't an issue. Now, as I said, there are a number of resources out there. Um, and I'd recommend you know, just reviewing the video later on, or I can also send a PDF of some of the stuff too, if you like. Uh, Xerxes Society has a lot of good resources on their website um, and planting guides. Attracting Native Pollinators came out a number of years ago from Xerxes. It was one of the first books that actually dealt with the various genera of bees, as well as butterflies. And it also has some educational programs, how to do uh, large and small scale habitat restoration or rewilding. Pollinator Partnership, you go to their website, you put in your zip code, and it will uh, select a number of, uh, in this particular area, two different uh, planting guides, Prairie Parkland and Eastern Broadleaf uh, Forest giving you examples of a variety of plants to plant that will support 
uh, birds, butterflies, bees, flies, etc. And there's now one for every place in the U. Actually, all of North America now. I think there's a few now for Mexico, and I think even Hawaii is also online. Of course, grow native. We all pretty much know about grow native. Um, I've produced a few different planting guides for grow native, which are also available out there for companion planting and setting up a pollinator garden. If you want to start identifying this stuff, this is actually one of my favorite books, The Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America by Eric Eaton. It doesn't have a huge amount of text, but it probably has more insects than any other field guide. So there's whole sections on bees, on flies, on wasps, on butterflies, um, and then a few odds and ends like spiders and stuff. But it gives you a good idea and the approximate sizes so you know what you're looking at. It gives you information on what they are so then you can look up later. But it's one of the few where you can actually really start telling some of the species apart in your garden. If you really want to get into the bees, of course, Heather Holmes books, you know, Bees and Identification Native Planting Forage, a guy which really focuses on the plants to plant and a pollinator of native plants, which also includes other pollinators. Bumblebees of North America, uh, second edition is actually being worked on right now. But if you're really into bumblebees, it has every bumblebee species of North America and also planting recommendation. Bees in your backyard uh, covers every genus, excuse me, of bee in North America. Um, when they're flying, shows the sizes, and it also has planting recommendations too. Um, there's a lot of good information. And also, if you really get into it, there's even identification guides if you're looking under a microscope of SMBs. So it's kind of a, a mixed book that's for the lay and the scientific. It's, I'm not sure what it really wants to be. So. And this is the book that I mentioned is coming out, I think, in May, Gardening for Moths. Uh, and it focuses on the Midwest. I can't tell you how good it is or anything, but it's really hard to find a book just focused on moths. And it covers a life history of, I think maybe close to a hundred different species. So it really is, a, a, I think it'll be a good resource and a way to start thinking about our nocturnal pollinators. If you really want to get into flies, uh, there are a number of resources, the field guide to the flower flies in Northeastern North America. The Field Museum of Chicago has a number of these online guides. So if you go to the Field Museum of Chicago's website, there are stuff on flies, several ones. Uh, there's one that just came out on lichens, uh, plants, et cetera. So there, and these are just simple downloadable uh, guides to get, give you an idea of some of that diversity. But yeah, Field Museum of Chicago, go to their website. Um, and then of course, flies, if you really wanna get into it, uh, the whole diversity of flies. And of course, Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, and the Nature of Oaks. Yeah, that's my wife, by the way, those are in the Mary Bronx. She also, she also works at the zoo, too. And we gave actually a copy. Our neighbor um, is a tree planter. He works with Forest Relief. He gets all these trees. He gets neighbors, and he's planting trees. He's like Johnny Tree Seed. Um, he's planting trees all over. but we felt he needed to know more. So we bought him the book, The Nature of Oaks, and Mary tagged just about every page for him to look at. There was a, there was a, bit, there was a bit too many marks in there and tabs. Here, this is important, this, this is important, this is important. It's a great book, you know, talking about oaks in the season. Uh, but, you know, I think it was just a few too many tags. And rewilding, if you're really interested in this idea of rewilding, there are more and more books out there coming out some which can be very specific. This is really kind of dealing with the sort of the science. This one I like because it, it's, I think it's for kids or adults, whoever just wants to find out what's actually happening. And it covers everything from uh, monarchs to wild boar in Berlin. Um, Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, which is really a different way of thinking about our relationship to nature uh, from an indigenous perspective. Farrell by George Monbiot, a big proponent of rewilding. Rebirding, in, which really focuses on birds of England. Rewilding is another good general, and probably kid's book, but it really gives an idea of what's going on. Wilding is a fascinating book by Isabella Tree. This focuses on uh, an estate that she and her husband inherited from the family called Nepa Estates in England. 
It's 3,500 acres. It was originally a farm, uh, but they had soil like St. Louis. And out of 17 years of farming, they only turned a profit two years out of 17. They tried all sorts of things from dairy to row crops to even specialty ice creams. So what they decided to do was return most of the land back to the wild. And they've reintroduced different species of deer, uh, wild cattle, um, wild boar. Uh, they've now introduced beaver. They now have some of the highest diversity of any place in England, which is, if we get concerned about the US being bad for biodiversity, England is ranked probably the worst in all of the EU and in good parts of the world. Uh, they've really decimated it. But now they have uh, European storks breeding for the first time in 633 years in England. They have the largest uh, population of turtle doves, the largest population of purple emperor butterflies, and they've now made it an ecotourism site. They have researchers working there, but you can camp there. They have lodging. They have all these things, and now they actually make a profit. Plus, because they haven't been allowed to uh, introduce predators like wolves and bears, they do have to harvest their, their uh, cattle and wild boar. So now they have specialty meats of these different varieties too. So it's been printing this whole thing, and she's got a new book coming out this year on the whole process of wilding too. And then Wilder is just, you know, excerpts from all over the world on different aspects of rewilding. And then the last two quotes to finish up, and I know I've gone way over time because I didn't over talk. Aldo Leopold, who I love uh, his work, and this is one of the, the best, one of, the, one of my favorite quotes. The last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but do not understand, then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And then from an indigenous perspective, Rubwell Kimmer, we need acts of restoration, not only, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands, but also for our relationships to the world. We need to restore honor to the way we live so that when we walk through the world, we don't have to avert our eyes with shame so that we can hold our heads up high and receive the respectful acknowledgement of the rest of Earth's beings. And with that, I thank you if I can hit this button properly. And my email address is spivak at stlzoo.org. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have or you know, other things. I've also put a few resources out um, as you're leaving. Um, brochure on monarchs. One, not being afraid of stings when you're inviting bees. Uh, bumblebees are essential. Bumblebees and climate change. Um, a simple two-page bee guide, as well as a planting guide for companion plantings for vegetables. And if you're just starting a pollinator garden, a little menu card. I did for uh, Grow Native to and some seed packs for you. Thank you, Ed. <laughs>